Cool. All right. Well, we can get started. Um, uh, so, in uh, yeah, if anyone has any like issues, just interrupt me, um, please. Uh, so, this is meant to be a birds of a feather, so kind of a discussion session about GPIO and pin control. Um, so, I put together a few slides just to get us started in the discussion, but um, everyone that's uh, um, joined, please uh, pipe up if you have any questions or comments or ideas. Um, and if you want to, I uploaded the slides in here, so you should be able to download them from Big Blue Button. Um, otherwise, you can hit up that URL there, that tiny URL. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, for people that uh, are maybe kind of new to this topic or uh, wanted some background material, I linked to some of the things that had happened in the last couple of years. Um, so we, last time we did kind of a uh, birds of a feather about this topic was at Len, uh, Lenaro Connect, a virtual one about two years ago. Um, Neil Armstrong gave a good talk at ELC last year about pin muxing. Um, uh, Bartosh gave a uh, talk about the um, design of the API uh, last year. And then I guess the most important thing for people to note is on Wednesday, um, Bartosh is going to be giving a talk as part of the IoT microconference. Um, so that'll go a lot more into libgpio uh, d v2. Uh, so just to give kind of an overview here to get us started. Um, so the status of the GPIO user space API or UAPI. Um, so ideally, you would be using uh, kernel drivers um, for GPIO. So there's many subsystem drivers that use GPIO. There's a long list there in the documentation. Um, but there are use cases where um, you do need to control uh, GPIOs from users um, from user space. So if you need to do that, um, Linus had uh, written a nice document there about um, if you're going to do that, some things to keep in mind. So I highly recommend reading that link there to the um, documentation. Um, and uh, probably most people know this, but if anyone doesn't, the SysFS interface for GPIO is, is a legacy um, user space API and it's deprecated now. So you should not use it. And you should use the character device or sometimes referred to as GPIOD. Um, and that's been around since Linux 4.8. So hopefully most people have that available on their systems. And uh, one of the uh, probably largest changes most recently was back in Linux 5.10. We had a new version two of the user space API um, and this uh, added some nice features and kind of cleaned up some things. Um, Kent Gibson worked a long time on getting that patch series um, ready. I know Linus or Bart, if you wanted to say anything about this. Um, but uh, I have some slides about the, some of those patches, the current patches. But um, yeah, the, uh, this is kind of what the uh, current state of affairs is now um, since Linux 5.10. And I had a slide here, Bart, if, if you wanted to talk about um, the way that you, uh, you're looking to expand what's in line info now, well, adding in the PID. Um, I, don't know I, if I literally, I literally mm -hmm. right now, I, I send an email to the, the mailing list uh, saying that this, this approach is wrong because I just okay. realized that, that the process can fork and then there's going to be two processes with the same, uh, with, with okay. the file descriptors, the same. Uh, request represented by an anonymous uh, iNode, so um, I'm, I'm not thinking on how to do that. And actually, it's a, it's a problem in itself because we haven't discussed a situation where two user space processes have the same set of lines request, like keep the same request open, and it actually can happen if the process forks. And I have never realized it, and I think nobody has. So yeah. <laughs> okay. So th this is not going to look like any anything like it uh, because. As it, as it is now, we can have multiple PIDs. Okay. Keeping the, the same request open. Did you want to um, maybe talk a bit about the the reasoning behind why you um, thought it? Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I received I received some off list email about uh, libgpid from time to time, and like on several occasions, people have asked me to to find to to get away to. Uh, to find out the PID of the process holding requested lines so that they can simply kill them if they have like some process in the background keeping the lines open and then they have the permissions to kill it and then they would like to find out what feed it is. And right now you can kind of do it if you set the consumer label to contain the PID, which you can do. 
uh, then you can browse the track uh, directory or, or just, just, just browse the, the, the command line of the processes and find out which one stores it, not the command line, but uh, all the, the, you can take the, the consumer label and then browse the command lines of, uh, of the processes to find out which one uh, set the label to, to, to certain strings. Um, but basically it's to easily find out which processes keeps vines taken and just kill it. Okay. Yeah. So the, the next couple of slides were kind of about some aspects of that patch. Series, so, <laughs> we can discuss uh, it like this. This is a blow up from. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Do, do you, does any of this still apply or not so much? Uh, no, no, this it still about, applies yeah. uh, given that we do something about the processes uh, forking. Like um, there is the O close on exec flag in open, which uh, sets the file descriptor to uh, to be closed in the in the in the forking process, the child process when it execs. Uh, maybe we could do something like. Uh, when the process forks, then we close this file descriptor in the parent. Um, okay. Uh, it's an idea. I, I don't know, like, um, I'll back to here, maybe some, some more ideas. Yeah, does anyone uh, anyone um, joining us today, does anyone have any suggestions? There was the other aspect of security, um, which I don't know if you had thought any more about that. Um, it seemed like it's probably not an issue. I, I don't think it is an issue because, yeah. like, on a default uh, configuration in a, any Linux distro, any user can browse the proc uh, PID FD, yeah, like, like on your slide, uh, directory, and, and, and can check what kind of file descriptors the process has uh, open and it will show up as unknown inode something something GPIO line. You will not be able to see which lines exactly, but you will be able to see that this process holds some lines. Okay. Yeah, so it looks like that's probably not too big of an aspect of this, um, but the, the the big thing that needs to, I guess you're saying needs to be figured out is how to deal with the, uh, the forking. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any ideas around that or any any comments? If people have not used the big blue button before software before, it works quite well. So um, feel free to um, chime in. Um, it works pretty well if there's like multiple people talking. I think it's uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting uh, with um, I, before. At, at some point, we had a bit of discussion around. Uh, I think Bartosz was working with uh, like a user space arbitration daemon. Uh, how does that relate to this PID thingy? It's not done yet, and it will not be done for some time still. Um, I think this is simply for for cases where people launch GPIO set and, and put it into background for some reason that then want to kill it, but they no longer know which PID it was. Yeah, fair enough. The, arb the arbitration demon will be a thing, but uh, yeah, first we need to release V2 and then we can start writing the demon. But uh, you know, it's, it's, it's given, given the, the, the current rate of development, uh, it's, it's going to be at least a couple more months. This is the Dbus um, thing yeah, that yeah. you talked about. Okay. Well, Dbus or other like I, I would, okay. Ideally, there would be a Dbus demon and then maybe some non-Dbus lightweight demon, but Dbus would be first because it's easier and also allows you for for to to create a a stable API easily. Okay. I tend to think about it like there's this uh, sensors IIO proxy that uh, ADES is working on and it's like the same thing for GPIO or something like that. So yeah, when you run a multiple user system, you sooner or later run into this problem that you have to arbitrate. What is, what is the IO proxy? I, I don't know what it is. Pardon? You, you mentioned some IO proxy? Yeah, there is... Uh, 
sensors IIO proxy, which is originally a GNOME component, I think, but it's used also in all other desktops. It's for arbitration of uh, sensor data. So they, um, if you want to like, if, if your desktop needs to know the rotation of the screen or the point of gravity or the compass or anything like that's the daemon that arbitrates IIO sensors up to different user space processes. Um, I don't know how much they have fought over the use case of not a graphic desktop or tablet or something, but uh, it's it's doing this arbitration and the broadcasting and so on on the on the D-bus. Yeah, anyway, um, the, the default behavior for a forking process is to keep the file descriptors of the power. And I have also what, what worries me is that I have never heard of a situation where there would be a need to close the file descriptors of the parent because it forked. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that it is not maybe easily possible yet in the kernel, and also this would be frowned upon. Could you do well with the children? Well, what would need to happen um, in order to keep always keep a single process. Um, Keeping the lines so keeping the lines requested, right. we would right. need to close the file descriptor of the parent when it forks. But is it even legal allowed? I don't know. Oh, so like you're thinking, is it legal to close the file descriptors of like if the child can close the parent's file descriptors? No, 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 no. So that, that would need to happen from the kernel. Like the kernel would need to close yeah. the file descriptors like on fork. Uh, yeah. The, the, the kernel would need to close the file descriptor like this specific file descriptor of the parent so that only the child keeps it open. Okay. And um, I don't like just at a quick glance, I don't see a way to do that. So, um, we could possibly um, add a flag like this to 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 uh, not, not even to the open system call because it's not in use. Just when we're creating a file descriptor, just an internal in kernel flag like this. But uh, I don't know. I don't know what what the file system folks would say about it. You mean like a a flag for a fork? or something within GPRT? No, no, for, 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 um, for whatever function, uh, well, it, it's car, so we are using character device, something, something that uh, creates the, um, the, the, the file descriptor for, yeah. uh, for the request. I, just let me see which one is it. Looking for it and it doesn't. So uh, we're using that to create a file descriptor, and that would need to take an argument that would say that on fork close this file descriptor. Okay, within the uh, you're talking about like within the C dev driver, GPIO C dev driver. Oh yeah, so we're using okay. and used SD flags. This is the one used. So this gives us the file descriptor, and it, we actually. Uh, you actually do pass the O read only and O close exec flags, and I'm thinking that we could have something like O uh, underscore underscore O close on close on fork close parent on fork. I don't know. Okay. Just like goes deep into the file system code and. Uh, and I'm, I'm just afraid that uh, sending this uh, such, such a patch to our viewer would result in in a rant. So it wouldn't be contained within GPIO, you're saying? No, no, it change. I, I don't think so. This is like a, a file system interface. Okay. So that's maybe not so practical. I, I don't see any other way, frankly. Mm. And unless we want some different behavior, so we, we can either keep it as, as is, like the forking process, just keep the request um, open, in which case uh, returning the PID of the of the folder would not work because we could have multiple, um, or we 
could return the last forked uh, owner of that request or the first or something in between. I don't know. It uh, doesn't sound very, very useful then. Okay. Just to give you an idea, even if like you launch GPIO set, but you launch it with the dash dash background uh, flag and it requests the line and then forks uh, and then the, the, the parent exits. The, the PID changed from the one we registered at request time. Okay. It's, it's the usual thing where a simple thing sounds simple and then, and then it's not. Right. What, 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 what do you think would be the problem if um, it wasn't able, wasn't possible to do this? Would it, would it ruin the entire idea of having a daemon that would, um, no, 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 no. actually, actually uh, the daemon is actually a solution to that, uh, in, in, in that it's the same, it's a single process that keeps all the line open on behalf of the user, the arbitration right. that Linus mentioned, uh, this is really for a situation where a user, like a, 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 a user. Linux user just launches several processes that request different lines and then wants to kill some of them. Okay. We did have a couple more people walk into the room, though we were having trouble figuring out uh, audio here. So probably best, I don't know. I could try and do a transition here where I see if I can do the HDMI audio. So. If the people I'm online don't mind, I'm going to try and see if I can move from my headphones over to the HDMI on the monitor. And we'll see if um, now we have a couple more people in the room, so we'll see if we can do that. Oh, okay. Could someone say something that's um? Uh, Uh, Bartosz, can you keep on speaking? I wanted to see if it comes out of the TV. Yeah, I'm speaking. Hello, test, test. Okay, great. The, volume the volume's a little low, but yeah, we can hear you. Let me see if I can crank up the volume here. Could you say something again, Bartosz? I'm saying something again. Actually, your voice became louder. Okay. Uh, oh, I changed the gain on my mic, not on the speaker, so okay. Yeah. Will this work? Yeah. Um, test, test, check, check. Anyways, um, so we were uh, we were talking about uh, for the people that just walked in, we were talking about the idea of having a daemon that could hold GPIO uh, file descriptors so that they don't die when um, when the uh, when the thing is holding it goes away. Um, so sorry, sorry to have interrupted you, um, Bart. Um, no, we were actually to... discussing an idea for uh, retrieving the PID, the PID of the process holding the requested lines, but it turns out that uh, it's not as easy because the process that requested lines can fork and then you have two processes that keep the same request open. And it's a problem and we're looking for ideas. Right. Um... I was seeing what I have next in, uh, I mean, kind of the, the next topic is libgpo v2. Um, oh, Gert has raised his hand. All right. Gert, did so you ask? Paul, uh, I'm yeah. wondering, can you use a fuser for that? What, what about a fuser? A fuser allows you to find out which process is using which files. A specific oh, file. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that, that, that is fine, but it's, it will only allow you to, uh, see that the process keeps this anonymous uh, i know like a reference to this I, I, anonymous i know but you cannot inspect the internals of it in that you cannot uh, that means you cannot see that this process uh, holds this specific line you can see it holds some gpio lines but not a specific gpio line yeah so it's not sufficiently fine no, no, no. yeah but if if you use the gpo aggregator to no, 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 no. IOs, then uh, you can do that at the system level. 
No, we, we are talking, we have two file descriptors. One is a file descriptor to the GPIO character device. Uh, that could be one coming from the aggregator. But when you request lines, you get another file descriptor uh, unrelated to the, like, related but independent from the character device, from the one referencing the character device. Uh, that is an anonymous uh, file descriptor and it doesn't really contain any visible info in user space, at least. Other okay. than being called GPIO lines, that's all you have. You don't even see which character device it came from. Does this make sense? What was the suggestion that you had? Your uh, I was I was transitioning the audio when you said that, so I didn't hear. Did you say F user? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I think you said F user. Um, would you, um, Bart? Would you want to? Um, do you think we should move on to talk about the lib GPIO uh, aspects? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so I guess for people that aren't familiar, uh, libgpod is a library in, in utility tools that um, um, Bart uh, created and, and maintains now. Um, and there's a diagram from one of Bart's uh, previous talks that kind of shows the different layers of it there. Um, so there's C++ bindings and Python bindings, um, and there should be Rust bindings coming soon. So there's the existing version that's released that's V1. A lot of distros have it packaged, so you should be able to find libgpiod. Um, but now that we have the V2 of the character device, um, the library is being updated as well. Um, so I think you'll be talking more about this right on Wednesday morning in the IoT yeah. microconference. But I just wanted to have a place here to um, speak about any aspects of the libgpiod that you wanted to, or if anyone else um, in in our BOF wanted to speak about it? Yeah, so I can uh, talk about it for a bit. So, so, so the goal is basically to uh, make it easier to use, uh, more intuitive, and also to uh, leverage the fact that the requests and the chips can live independently. Uh, the whole idea, like my, my, my aim, is to uh, make the, well, the C API will probably end up being a bit more complex, not, not even more complicated, but complex in that more calls will be required to achieve the same uh, goal. But all, but in, in return, the higher level bindings like Python, C++, Rust should be much uh, more concise, allow, allow to write much, much more concise code and uh, easier to use in general, which is probably the goal because from, from the email I'm getting, I, I, I can tell that uh, most people use Python and not C. Right. So, yeah, let's just make it easier for them. Yeah, I remember there was a discussion uh, maybe earlier in the summer um, where you were talking, you were advocating for being able to make the like the Python simpler and not necessarily like a a one to one correlation between the the um, like the C code. So I, I wanted to actually implement all the uh, features of C, or rather mirror the data model in C that we haven't seen in Python, but it was Kent's argument that uh, we shouldn't that we should leverage really what Python can, can do and uh, not strictly follow the, the C model, just uh, do whatever works best in Python. And uh, well, it turned out that he was probably right, uh, as he usually is, and uh, we, I, I, I decided to switch it a bit and, and start working on something that, uh, that just uh, works best in Python, is, is how, you, how, how they refer to it, Pythonic. Right. The current status of that is that uh, I, I, I will, maybe today I will repost uh, the, the, the rework of the line settings that we have in, in, in progress right now. And on top of that, like this already will contain the C++ changes, but on top of that, we will build the Python part. Okay. I, I have some, some work in progress code, but uh, still need some more work. A couple of weeks probably. And for anyone that wants to, they can go to the repo and they can look at the uh, GPIOD uh, 2.0 branch, right? If they want to see how things are looking. 
Is that right? Yes. Okay. So all the all the latest stuff that you're working on is in there. Yeah, and uh, well, no, the Python work is actually on my on my GitHub. It's not in the next branch yet because it it wasn't reviewed. Okay. Um, yeah. So next is more like uh, things that are already queued for for the deep learning. Anyway, it, it would be great to hear some um, some ideas if, if you think that any any feature should be part should be made part of the V2 release. It would be a good moment to to tell to say it now because uh, once we freeze the the API, I, it's, it's not going to be as easy to add new features. For the people in the room, I, if you want to come up here, because I don't know how far the mic will go, <laughs> but if anyone wants to say anything, or you can try, we can see if they can hear. Well, the, the thing I experienced with my PIP, right, is that it's much slower in the user space. Can you, um, are you able to hear this? Far yes, far? yes, it's much slower oh. in the user space. Oh, cool. Yeah, so it's like if you just export via SysFS, and then you just like, um, like, uh, uh, the thing that way, it's in user space is much faster than using like the GPIO set commands. Um, but I guess the C is fast. C is still faster. So. No, uh, sorry. You mean that GP like launching GPIO set is much slower than using CSFS? Is that? It? Yeah, because like a typical use case, right? If they're not using like a Python bindings, they're just using GPIO like get and set, right? It's mm -hmm. much more than doing the if they just export the GPIO once and then start like just setting the direction bit on the up. I, I, I haven't tested that, but I would assume that you still do fork in order to echo something to, to the SysFS file, just like you fork to launch GPIO set. But uh, I may yeah. be wrong, Bash, Bash may not, may avoid forking for a simple echo, so with that. Like a like a you know a lot of our users have just been testing back and then they're like why is this so much slower than just using Echo so I mean that's just the point of the but I just want to bring to your attention not necessarily that it can be addressed or anything. I think Echo is intrinsic to Bash so that will be faster yeah because it doesn't need to fork. Well, the, the, I guess, uh, now the question is, I, I haven't timed that, but uh, would Python be faster than SysFS? Like, even if you launched a Python shell and just uh, type the commands by hand? Uh, probably, I, I, I haven't personally tested, but that's just, uh, that's just a, something I noted, wow. Yeah. I was using uh, like uh, I was using it to do a software bit bank or uh, uh, a spy, right? And then the mm -hmm. uh, CFS version of my simplistic code was like approximately twice or three times faster or something. Um, it, it makes sense because you still fork every time with GPIO set. Yeah, yeah, of course. So you're basically context searching a bunch of times, yeah. and, which is a lot, right? but. Um, but it'd be cool if, like, there was some. I'm guessing also, like, GPI was set probably sets up like a bunch of different registers in pen control every single time it runs. I didn't know if there was a callback or something that we can just like prevent that from happening. Uh, yeah, looking for something like I squared C transfer tool, which is kind of scriptable. Yeah, yeah, so but it's kind of like kind of scriptable that. That's... So, so, like, with the I squared C transfer, you can do like. Mm -hmm. Read from that register, write to that register, read from that register, write to that register, yeah. and you just, like the tool just starts and then does all these transfers in one go and then terminates. Yeah, like a, Are we able to hear that part? Uh, what yeah, mark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could see transfer, multiple transfers, yeah. Kind of in the background, but I, I can still hear. Yeah. With the I square C, it is easy because you just specify bus and then what you want to do. But I can imagine with GPIOs you could do the same thing. Like, okay, well, GPIO ship this, and then direction that pin or this pin mask. Yeah, like something scriptable. So if I may, uh, if I may 
address that. Uh, if you are thinking about making some compound uh, line requests, it's, it is really the goal of the UAPI v2 and uh, the GPID, GPID v2 that it will in a single, basically in a single IOCTL, it will be able to transmit uh, multiple context or rather like a compound configuration. Request this line in output and this line in input, uh, wait for events on this line, but set the output value of this line to this. And you can all, you can do all that in a single request. So this is precisely the, the aim of the V2. And then, and this, this had been already identified as the weakness of V1. So, uh, does that help? Hello, I, I cannot hear anything. Oh, I, I think he yeah, was thinking. We're, we're thinking. We're <laughs> yeah. I, I don't see you, so I don't know, sir. Yeah, I know. Maybe something like that's a tough one. I think a little bit. It's starting to move towards like the findings for the Oh, that's cool. Inject. Sorry, this is this is not not loud enough. I, I can't understand. Anything. Oh, you. Uh, that's cool. I, I don't think you could hear, but I think the comment was uh, were you saying. EBPF? Something like this. I okay. could inject a little bit of a code into the kernel and have it split the GPIO since you need something. Yeah. Like oh, okay. A, in, in terms of bit banging, uh, if you needed something yeah, happening like very a fast. Macro type. Not in the, in the kernel sense, but like a, like a macro program that just like runs. Bit banging. Yeah, it, it's probably banging. similar to what the uh, Linux infrared people have been doing for protocol decoding. Oh. So they also ah, okay. have programs uh, for basically bit banging or, or decoding bit banged infrared. Oh, okay. oh my God, that's, that, 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 is, that is something uh, much more complex and uh, outside of the scope of the character device, I would say, or un unless yeah, it's, it's something like EBTF more than, than what we're trying to do. What do you think, Linus? Uh, I mean, you can always come up with some domain-specific language for anything, and of course, that's going to be faster if you compile it to, you know, VPF or just run it in a loop inside a C program. That's fine. It's going to be fast. So, I mean, it's uh, it's, it's just a matter of approach, I would say. Like, uh, if if you uh, have a specific task and you program that in a C program, a daemon or something. It's going to run on factory line, wherever it's it's going to be fast with the uh, the GPIOD. It's but if you do this thing where you fork a set value for like which is a C program for every time you set the line, yeah, well, it's not going to be fast if you compile it on an MMU less system, so it becomes V fork instead. It's going to be faster. Like everything is up to like how you phrase the question more or less. It's just a thought. There's probably, yeah. Um, maybe another uh, idea for finding which processes have a uh, specific line open. There's in proc this file fdinfo, which is now used by uh, DRM for exporting information. So you can basically attach additional information to file descriptor accessibility user space in proc. fdinfo, you're saying? Yes. It's uh, okay. It's in proc. Let me just quickly see if there, I have a modern kernel here. And let me just quickly see if that uh, what oh. does it contain as the info. Okay. But the uh, uh, subsystem could attach the information which lines are open on that file descriptor and that user space. Oh, you mean, because I, I see, like, I, I, I just did a cat on a file descriptor to an open GPL request, and it just says pause zero flags some flag I, I guess and then tid uh i i note number so i could add my own line to this yes oh yeah i guess it would make some sense and look at what the um drm gpu stuff is doing they export gpo um, gpu load information there 
GPU load key. Is the function? Is it? Is it what? What is it? Let, let me check. Okay, never mind. I, I will check that later. But thank, thanks for the heads up. I, I wasn't aware this exists, and that you can extend it. Yeah. Oh, so it's a directory called FB info. That's a subdirectory of the PIDs. Okay. I I, I guess uh, we yeah yeah yeah. It's like proc uh, PID, and there was the I FD directory. Now there's also FD info, and it contains lines of some stats. So if we could add, um, yeah. The thing is, how would we represent that um, elegantly? Because we would need to. Somehow represent which lines. Oh. It's it problem is that this it's so detached from the GPIO uh, interface that it would be hard to convey that uh, in, a, in, a, in some in some logical way. Because what what I was thinking is that you get information for a line from a character device's file descriptor, and then you see which process holds it. Uh, this is different. This is like the other way around. You check the processes, you check their FD info, you read all those files, and then you find one which says that ha it has lines open. So now we already know that this file descriptor contains GPI, like refers to a GPI request. How do we make it contain the information that we, we would normally get from the other side, like, like that we would normally already have, that is, which line we're checking? Uh, because the, the request is more complex, it 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 uh, it contains the offsets of the lines. But how would we store the information about which chip it references? Uh, like wh wh which chip is the parent? It's, I need to think about it. It's I'm I'm, I'm, I'm rambling, but uh, I'm, I'm I'm just trying to make sense of that and how we could use use it. But it it, it sounds interesting. I I need to check this one. Thanks for the heads up. I, I think returning PIDs is going to be more difficult in the future with things like PID namespaces and uh, PID FDs and so on. So you can pass FDs around so it's not static information. Going from the other way around, looking at which file descriptors you have to see which resources. You're right. You're right. Uh, yeah, I, I, I haven't thought about namespaces, which adds another layer of complexity. <laughs> Like, if you have a process that can inspect other processes this way, aren't you leaking information? Say again? I think you need to, uh, Mark was asking if you are leaking information via uh, the FP info stuff. Yeah, that's right. I think you need to have uh, P-Trace privileges. Uh, sorry, I can't hear that. Can, Drew, can you repeat that? Um, yeah, so if you want to um, access the character device that actually PIO, whatever, and you can request a list of PIDs which are associated with a specific line as a process. It allows you to observe what other processes are doing, right? Okay, so you're saying um, for, for so um, if you if you're one process and you can read from the chip, and there's other processes that also have lines open. Oh, the, yeah. You can like figure out that the other processes have the line open. Right. That would be a problem. Just be, and that's based on you both having access to the chip. Okay. That would be a potential security issue. Right. Because you can technically establish a side channel this way, right? I was just going to ask, are there some pin control questions or slides? Because I would have to drop out a little few minutes oh. before noon. OK, let's, let's, let's go to pin control. You can go back to the GPA later. Yeah, um, I just had one like minor one. Um, but it would also be interesting to see if anyone has any um, other things related to pin control. Um, so one of the things that happened since, well, like the last in-person plumbers was I added this pin muck select file to debugfs. Um, the motivation there was to allow people to be able to, on the BeagleBone, be able to change the muxing of the header pins um, while they're doing things like fretboarding. Um, so the, the solution we ended up having was that you can uh, 
echo in a group name and function name uh, into this file, and it will then um, set that function for, for that group. Um, so I was curious if anyone else has tried this, if, if it's useful for anyone, or if anyone had any thoughts about this. Um, but also, if there's any other pin control topics, um, while well, Linus is still with us. Uh, does this work well for you, for your use case, uh, Drew? Uh, it does. We have some other like <laughs> issues we need to sort out to like move over to this, but um, for the purposes of changing the the pin muxing, um, this does solve the issue we had with that um, uh, bone pin mux helper driver. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. At least it's solving some problem. Mm -hmm. Integrate with uh, the Renaissance overlay stuff. No, this is not, this is just, um, it's just a simple uh, thing in DebugFS. So if you set up your device tree in a way that um, you, you, for example, like we can set up a device tree so that like the header pins have groups and functions associated with them, then this just it gives you the ability to switch between those at runtime. But what about like Oh, uh, Gert, yeah, go ahead. Gert, Gert raised his hand because he uh, does that, I believe. Yeah, so, uh, well, I did try your patch and it worked fine. Uh, personally, I'm not using it because usually if I want to do something similar, I use a DT overlay that I load dynamically, which is not supported upstream, I know. But uh, anyway, it's, it's a dangerous thing, just like uh, DT overlays in general. But it can be useful for, uh, for testing. And yeah. Prototype. So uh, if you were wondering, like overlays would have been the ideal solution, um, and that's the original intention with the with the capes and with this sort of stuff was we had a cape driver and you could tell it to load and unload overlays. But we ended up abandoning that when we realized that um, that was never going to go upstream, that we weren't going to have um, ability to do device tree overlays at runtime in Linux. So we okay. we give up on that, and we have I guess some background that was in the previous boff we had um, like uh, two years ago. But we have a driver called the Bone Pin Mux Helper that creates SysFS entries that allows you to tell it to put a um, put a pin into a, a different pin control state. But it does it in kind of a silly way. It was creating a character device for every pin on the header, not a, a platform device, not a character device, a platform device for each one on the header, and then it was changing the the pin control state between those. Um, so that was kind of a, a silly way of doing it, but um, that's what we had been using. So that's why I was trying to figure an upstream way to allow us to do runtime pin muxing. Um, device tree our overlays would have been preferable, but we, we didn't think that that was going to be a, a thing that we would be successful. Oh, we didn't think it was going to be successful because it, it doesn't look like it's ever going to happen. So um, what's, the, the, what's the practical reason that it's not possible? So well, I think so. Uh, Frank Rowan, who's one of the device tree maintainers, he has a long list of things on eLinux Wiki about okay. issues that he sees with device tree overlays, and I, I'm not sure if anyone if those are ever going to get solved um, sufficiently. So, uh, from a practical standpoint, I think most boards we we're doing it. I think most other boards are doing their overlays in U-boot now or yeah. whatever bootloader they happen to have on their platform. Um, so that works. It's just we get the complaint of the reason why we have this runtime ability, we have a utility called config pin, and you can say for, for this header pin, I want it to be I2C or I want it to be PWM. That's part of like our tutorials where people will be breadboarding something and then they move on to the next tutorial and they just use that config pin utility to change the pin state for the header pin. Um, we could do the similar thing with reboot, like, okay, you changed the overlay, now you reboot, um, but that's kind of breaks the flow. So. Yeah. The whole idea of the runtime stuff was for people that are breadboarding to give, not make them have to reboot. Um, so this was kind of the, the the goal with this one was to have a way to do that because previously there was no way from user space to change uh, pin mux. Um, so this this does now give that facility, um, but it takes some uh, um, other structure like you have to create your device tree in such a way that like all the possibilities you would want are encoded into um, pin groups and pin functions. Um, uh, I would formulate the problem such that uh, runtime enablement of non-discoverable hardware is just like something that 
we worked on it for years and the device tree overlays at runtime was like what people thought would solve it. Unfortunately, it has so serious security implications that I don't think it will ever fly. Uh, what people should be doing is create discoverable hardware. I, I'm sorry about that. Or do their overlays in U-Boot or whatever, but doing it at runtime with non-discoverable hardware, like the, there's nothing like such that works. Well, yeah. what about FPGAs? So Marek mentioned FPGAs, which I suppose are the one thing that does change during runtime potentially, right? Yeah, you can load a different, you can actually do part of the configuration, so you can reload part of your FPGA at runtime. Right, right. And I believe that's one of the very few places where the EOs at runtime would make sense. Because it is highly isolated part of the system. Yeah. I mean, that is, I think, maybe one of the real use cases. I mean, so this breadboarding, you know, workshop thing, I mean, it's, it's kind of a minor it's use case. Um, the, the idea of capes, you know, you're really not going to, you're not going to really connect and disconnect a, um, an expansion board like a cape during runtime. Um, so I, I, I would think most of those use cases probably take care of by just rebooting. But yeah, FPGAs, I think, are, uh, are a thing that uh, they can't necessarily do well, that. So. You have an FPGA cape, right? You yeah. Load the FPGA and you technically disconnect the cape at runtime because the FPGA bit goes out of date while you reload it. Yeah. Well, I've been discussing that with FPGA vendors, I think. Uh, and uh, my stern recommendation was to create something that's discoverable. It doesn't have to be like USB or PCI or there is that thing that uh, this Google Aura project was using, like another discoverable bus. Like, or just come up with something. Even the Prime Cell bus that ARM has is better than nothing, as long as it's discoverable. Okay, the problem with FPGAs and discoverable stuff is that um, logic elements are expensive. The moment you make anything discoverable, you need bigger FPGA and you pay more. Like eventual one wire, I think it's a discoverable one wire. Uh, that would be. Yeah, but like that's why the people doing the FPGA work they are trying to minimize the designs, therefore making them non-discoverable and leave the software to do all the magic. And then you buy smaller FPGA and you pay less. So have you, um, the FPGA people, are you, you've been interacting with them, uh, Linus, you said? And off and on. I mean, uh, I think the CTO of uh, Xilinx comes to our office every now and then. But uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the I, I guess you, you get what you pay for with this. If, if, you're discovery, if you're not engineering in discovery, and that creates a security problem because you have to use debug FS, like that, so be it. Uh, it's the same thing like with uh, if you're working in the lab with breadboards and uh, capes and so on. If, if uh, security is not engineered into it, like then debug FS is fine. You just enable it, you just use it and be happy. It's uh, You can drive a truck through that security hole, but if the system isn't networked and isn't you know available, then you know, fine, I guess. Yeah, so I guess it kind of, I mean, so for the fretboarding, obviously that's kind of like a thing where, you know, security is probably not too strong of a concern because it's like you're, you're meant to be kind of like experimenting, right? And then hopefully you would encode that into a device tree when you're done with it, right? But for the FPGAs, I guess, uh, what are the circumstances when you do like a partial reconfiguration on a system? Are there like external events that cause that to happen or? No. Well, you also have to threat model if you're going to have security around this. Like the threat model, the, mo the most serious attack on a GPIO-like system that we have seen that was Stuxnet that, that attacked these uranium centrifuges in Iran. I, if you have that kind of use case, you have to design for it. If you are not running a uranium centrifuge, you're, like, you're probably not in such a big problem like trouble. It's like pre-populating a list of possible threats that could Rather than make it discoverable, just pre-populate it. Right. Uh, well, so yeah, one of the I mean, things that's what the Pinmux kind yes. of does. Yeah. So the 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 thing with Pinmux Select, which I felt one of the reasons why it was somewhat safe, is it only allows you to select between existing uh, pin group 
existing functions for existing pin groups. So you can't just necessarily do something arbitrary. I mean, there could be some danger in there, but it's also, you know, um, it's meant for like experimentation. So, yeah, I mean, if you enable this on a runtime system, you can certainly disturb your uh, uranium centrif centrifuge by uh, changing yeah. the pin maxing at runtime. That's that's entirely possible. And if you're running, like, if you're creating such a secure system, then like design it from the ground up to be, you know, not even using the character device, maybe, or you know, things like that. Security aspect where they're just signed and it's just like you know EFI boot style like signature and then it checks against this, it verifies it and like just incorporate the QPIs infrastructure into the overlays. Yeah. Um, if you have a stringent security requirement, we already need to ensure that you're uh, loading authentic uh, bitstreams to get PGA. So at yeah. that point, so that that can actually be on. Tested by the FPGA itself for, for dynamic reconfiguration. Well, I mean, when you have a base thing which is signed and encrypted, then the FPGA has a decryption key and has some sort of a certificate in it, so it can authenticate the base thing. You cannot load arbitrary anything into it anymore. That happens while. It's is loaded into the FPGA. So, like the FPGA SRAM is programmed, but if the bitstream cannot be authenticated, it is dropped. So, like that, the uh, configuration is not applied. But so, the FPGA is mm -hmm. uh, on the kernel side here with the DPOs. The FPGA hardware itself is capable of uh, verifying the Okay, so the FPJ can make sure it doesn't load up bad bitstream. Yeah, but uh, so in, in terms of overlays being protected, I guess if I guess there's nothing checking that right now to see. Just like an HMAC on yeah. top of the overlay, mm -hmm. it should just cut it, right? Like so, you would like basically in your device tree, you would specify like a like a key or something to check it, and then just HMAC like a you would fit image, yeah. it could be signed <laughs> and encrypted yeah. exactly this way. Yeah. And which can also be used to obtain the FPGA a bit. So you are moving in. That could be a secure but complicated solution for the problem, possibly. So in this situation, it, we would say we have more confidence in being secure because you can't load arbitrary overlays. Yeah. Okay. And then you would like, you know, like, you know, um, well, I, with respect to the security, it's not like a random user can uh, change your pin contour. I mean, if if you have the permission to do that, you probably also have permissions to do other dangerous things in the system, like killing other processes or whatever. So it's the da the most dangerous thing in in DT overlays and in this is that you make silly mistakes. If you put wrong information in the initial DT DTB, that's your system booting from. You can also damage the system. Right. Yeah, could it be you can craft malicious device to your overlay? Would what? Avoid something in the system at downtime, like disable crypto from the can, right? Yeah. Oh, like this. Okay. Well, so uh, your with your um, GPO aggregator, you you were kind of coming at that from a security angle, right? As well, Virt with virtual machines. Uh, yes, so we wanted to export GPIOs to a, a virtual machine. And initially, the initial version, I just had a way to tell uh, QEMU take that take these GPIOs and use them. But then the, uh, the virtualization people suggested that it would be better to not put that uh, 
information inside to not handle that inside QEMU, uh, but create some virtual GPIO device, which was the, became uh, the aggregator. So that means that uh, the, all the security is handled by the kernel. Right. So that, that seems like a pretty good solution for GPIO then, right? For um, having uh, separating like the privileges. But uh, so I guess, so that's, I mean, do any of those, do you think any of those concepts would uh, um, translate over to other types of devices or? Or pin muxing in general. Did we lose you? Or oh, uh, Gert, did we lose you? His microphone dropped. Oh, there he goes. The Wi-Fi is a little bit sketchy today. Huh? Yeah, is uh Bart? Can you still hear us? Yeah, yeah, I can. Okay, all right. We were wondering if we had some uh, AV issues here. No. All right. Um. So, did I think Linus dropped? Right. He said he had to go. I think, which makes sense because I think he had to go at um. Uh, yeah. So. Um. Yeah, so Bart or the other people that are left, um, are there other topics that uh, people want to discuss or we could keep on talking about the overlay security? I, I, I will still have the, the, this other presentation doing the IoT truck. Uh, yes, that's right. So, yeah, yeah in I, fact, I, I, think, I, I think so. Kent just responded to me some. Um, I, I think that the rest of the discussion on that big thing will happen on the list. Okay. I, I think I missed it in the beginning uh, with the demon to keep GPIO handles open. There was a suggestion to use Dbus. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, this is an idea that Bartosz has had, but he uh, it would be after the the V2 gets released, right? Yes. Did yes. you want? So I think the question was uh, maybe about. Uh, why you were thinking Dbus or? Yeah, or, or why a daemon? Uh, from my perspective, it, it was suggested for the uh, to keep a GPIO in a specific state, even if the process is not running. Yeah, yeah. So this is the main issue people have with uh, switching from SysFS to character device, where previously you have this uh, arbitration agent in the kernel that is the SysFS, um, the SysFS code basically that run that you know is is, is this uh, global consumer of lines that stays alive stays alive even if the any, any of the processes that uh, re right to it uh, die and people actually want to have this arbitration and this is why a central daemon that would expose a well-known dbus api and then talk to the character device would make sense then whatever interface you're using uh, whether you use like some command line tools for Dbus or you have your own script uh, in whatever language, it, it's, it simply works. Uh, we have some systems which don't use Dbus and still could use something like that functionality. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. So this is another thing that I would probably do in the future. Uh, that is a non Dbus central authority for GPIOs, but. Uh, I think so personally, it's been a very long time since I've last used a system, a Linux system without Dbus. I, I just don't see them in the wild anymore. Uh, so I think that Dbus is, is, is a good choice because first it will be much faster implementation. And second, it, it is standardized and, and has lots of different interfaces to use it. But yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not saying no to this idea. It's just that this is going to be more difficult because then what do you do? Do you only provide a command line tool or do you also provide some kind of a library to interact with this non dbus daemon? Uh, do you use, I don't know, what do you use? Protocol buffers? It, 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 it raises a lot of questions unlike the dbus implementation. I thought I was going to suggest protocol buffers or something like Thresh where you have standardized. I cannot hear that one. 
Oh, uh, well, this was uh, Chris uh, just joined, from the, the uh, runner of the IoT uh, microconference. Mm -hmm. um, and you were saying protobuf or yeah, something? Protobuf. It's really good. Driving serialization and deserialization protobuf. Which Dbus provides as well, right? Yeah. In some ways. I, I cannot hear anything you have to repeat it through. You can, uh, yeah, so I, yeah, protobufs. Okay. Uh, Protobufs is a thing from uh, Google, I think, oh, originally, yeah. right? Yeah, so you were suggesting maybe using uh, Protobufs? Yeah. yeah I think with Protobufs, it's just a description of the of the protocol. You still need to implement all around it, like the networking part and or, or IPC part. And... Yeah, exactly. I mean, so it's either going to be something like um, uh, it was originally Dbus or some other user space service that has the same architecture. Really? Like what? Well, it, it, you're you've essentially just got, just got a process that handles the um, the state that doesn't change, and a protocol for, I guess, uh, in that case, it would be probably multiple subscriber, multiple subscriber, multiple publisher. Yeah, yeah. Well, which is which is the bus? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> when you don't have the bus on your system. <laughs> and you have a uh, distributed system for something that should be pretty simple. So, so I'm, I'm thinking about yeah, low-level embedded systems, real-time systems, and I don't really want to talk uh, to a protobuf or debug service just to specify what should happen if my process crashes. No, no. So um, I, I'm worried that Dbus would not have, would have nothing to do with Protobuf. The, the Protobuf idea was for the for the non Dbus Dbus demon. I am uh, aware that this is something that it would be useful too, and uh, it's just that uh, I will definitely go first with Dbus because it's pretty clear how to do that. Uh, it would be a fast implementation and a well known protocol. For the non Dbus, there's uh, a lot more work involved, so that will be like a Hobby project for for the future, and, and, unless something someone uh, decides to simply write it for me. Yeah, it's just basically like additional features for the same application, right? I mean, if you're not using Dbus, it's mainly just a configuration problem. Also, uh, there's another thing. So, what Kent uh, works on, and this is not part of the of the next branch yet, but uh, he's working on GPIO set in daemon mode, or rather. In interactive mode, where you can uh, send text commands, like human readable text commands, to GPIO set to change, uh, you know, to, 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 set, to set different output values. And then you could also just have a pipe to it and uh, talk to it from a different process. Um, so, so there's that. I, I think it's going to be part of the, of the next, of the, of the V2 release. Does this uh, work for you? I, I would prefer to just talk directly to the kernel via the IRC interface to keep things simple. Oh, you can you can do that with the with the library. Yeah, but if my process crashes, uh, the GPIO returns to an undefined state. Yeah, so th this is this is how how file descriptors work and how. Devices work in, in Linux. It's it's very much by design. It, it, it depends on what system you're talking about. So yeah, but if, if you are talking about some sort of a GPIO team, practice the GPIO is also related to that. Yeah, so, so I, I would like... I just prefer to have uh, an option per line which is the default state if not nothing is connected. So I can set it up uh, when my process starts, and if it crashes, it goes to a safe state. And the the problem with that is that this is very much driver dependent, because some drivers leave lines in, in undefin undefined state, some uh, keep the last set state. Uh, it, it's not done in, in the GPID, it's really done at the driver level. It could be done in the framework. That's also something that could be validated in a test uh, framework, exactly. like so. If you implement the GPIO interface inside a Linux kernel as a driver, uh, you must, like the test interface should say, you must leave such and such state, you know, uh, otherwise it's it's incompatible or failure. Or it's kept open in the, by the framework in a specific state.
Hi, Drew and others. Uh, this is Cengiz speaking. Hello. Hi. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, I was just listening to the conversation and I I heard the keyword debus many times, so I would like to add my like uh, two cents into the conversation. So recently, I mean, last year, I developed uh, a Yocto distribution which was specifically using DBus to control uh, GPIOs and, I, uh, and another switch card over I2C. And I was the like the initiator of converting everything to DBus so that we can integrate CAN bus and you know other IoT inputs like that we can make it to interconnect each other. But sadly, at least like in my case, DBus had so much overhead for uh, I mean, the user inputs were was just getting delayed. I don't know why. Uh, yeah, the namespace is so clear. Yeah, and so having well-defined methods and properties are like excellent for getting the state information and whatnot. But I think the somehow it's not very suitable for uh, time-sensitive initiations of like GPIO on-off switches like that. So this, this product was specifically an IoT oven. Yeah, they they still produce this. And, you know, when you turn the knob to left or right, there was at least a 600 millisecond delay for the functionality. So, yeah, that's my two cents. That's huge. Right. It's, it's huge, but um, it makes me wonder if it's not your system's configuration in some in some way. Because, like, for my uh, day job, I, I just recently uh, was doing a thing where we would basically have processes like a backend process and a UI process, and we would send like coordinates uh, for animations happening on the on the UI uh, over Dbus, and it would like I, I haven't measured that because there was no need, but the delays were negligible. Like uh, it, it was almost. Look, looks like real time, so we never even bothered uh, instrumenting it in any way, uh, measuring performance. And uh, the six 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 hundred milliseconds sounds huge. Yeah, yeah it, even if I it's mean, a issue, uh, oh. debugging and analyzing that with debugs is, is not trivial. If we could avoid avoid that complexity for GPIO. If you have something like a container running on top of the system and you need a pipe between the container and the, yeah. the base runtime, basically, where the container comes out and says, okay, well, I should flip this GPIO. How do I do that? Or instead of by exporting the Java interface into the container, you have like a DBus interface between the container and the base runtime. And you can add DBus policy, you can really restrict it nicely on the DBus side. Okay, yeah, that's yes. a nice feature, I guess. I prefer also the direct interface of the Linux kernel, personally. Even then, I mean, when you've got the Linux uh, kernel and user space boundary, you're still going to suffer in terms of latency. Can you use IOU ring? Yeah, no, that's very interesting. I haven't... Well, so if you just use IO pills, it just looks fine. I'm really learning firmware projects. <laughs> <laughs> So in terms of, so it sounds like one of the reasons BART is interested in DBus is it would be simple to implement uh, for like a lighter weight alternative. Is, is there, do you have ideas for how implementation might work? Or, um, would, would it... well, you, I think you were saying earlier um, that what if the framework held the FD open or what if the framework when it closes it could set it back to a defined state? Yes, just okay. per line have the, System-wide default, where it returns to if no process gives it open. Okay. So that seems to be an extremely simple mechanism. So I can set it up when my process starts, but it's the safe state of my output. And if the process crashes, it is set. 
good. So currently, I think even with the uh, character depth interface, some systems behave differently. So on some SDM, I can set GPIOs and close the device and still set, but on others it isn't. So it's, yeah, this, this is what I was saying. Like this happened at the driver level. So some drivers keep the status, some some don't, and and some drivers don't even bother, and it's up to the hardware to to either keep some state uh, or not keep it. So I think the framework should specify which behavior. Which is I, so driver. that that wouldn't be a problem, but I suppose that you also want to uh, be able to set that default status, that, that the default behavior from user space, right? Yes. Yeah, so this is uh, this is much uh, this is different because we 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 are always uh, wanting to untie the kernel state, the kernel the kernel behavior from from the user space. As as soon as the user space process dies, it just releases the line and the kernel does whatever, uh, and the line should and then the, the user space process should not have any say in what the kernel will do later with that line. But the, the result should not be random. It's not random, it's driver dependent. Okay. There should be a driver consistency test though. I'm looking for some sort of a GPIO hook which can be taken over by user space. Might also work. Because right now you cannot request GPIO which is GPIO hooked in the DT yes. or in user space. But if you could do that, would that be what would you would want? Would work for me, yeah. So being able to set a hog from user space is what you're oh, yeah. Even, and the hog, if it is released by the process, would, re would return to the uh, hog. It would return to the hog state. Yeah. OK, so you define a hog, and then when the file descriptor closes, it goes back to the hog. What do you think of that part? It's always being coded in device state. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, you, have to, you have to repeat. Sorry, so the, I guess the idea is, um, let's say you've configured a hog for that GPIO. And then um, when the file, and then someone, the process starts using it as a line. And when it, when the file descriptor closes, that that pin could go back to the state that the hog specifies. Um, but you cannot request a line that is already hogged. Hmm. Okay. Is this the whole? Is the whole idea to of, of the whole like the whole reason for for hogging is so that nobody takes this line. Well, and and setting some some state. So there are cases where hardware requires that the specific output state is set on the GPIO to be safe, but I still want to use it from user space when I am in some specific mode. Currently, I don't think it's possible to specify that in the device tree. No, you can either hog a line or, or not hog it and then Oh, you mean you, you would want to specify the default state from device tree? Yeah, I guess it would make sense. Yeah, so if I look at the like the, the line, the line is still the line. You mean the line would be still available both to kernel and user space consumers, but it would have some defined state that to which it would always revert to when not used. Is that it? Yes. yes. Yeah. This 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 does make sense. Yeah. This, this sounds like a like a valid use case. So for, for example, some uh, line which controls an external motor or something, and if, as long as nothing is actively controlling that, it should be low. Yeah, yeah, this, this makes sense. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think there's a way to do that right now. It sounds like uh, uh, solving that safety issue that I think a lot of people have raised. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Someone who's not on works on uh, speaker systems, and his concern was like, he said if the line state changes, it can break the speaker. Um, so he's still using the old interface. Um, so I think this sort of facility would solve that problem. But is this something that is uh, feasible to, to do? I mean, is it, is it I a change? See, I, don't, I, I don't see why uh, the, the kernel code, GPIO lib code, could always call the relevant driver callbacks to set some value. And it will always also know when the GPIO is, is released. So yeah, it, it should be feasible. Actually, now when now when I think about it, it, it sounds like like something that is very useful. And and I'm surprised that we don't have it yet. But uh, yeah, it's uh, a it, 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 it does some, it does. But this 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 is completely out of scope of uh, the GPIO. This is really like the 
external core GPIO support. And it might make uh, the different uh, drivers behave more consistently. You're right, you're right. Because if you just define what happens, and if the driver doesn't work that way, it is broken and must be fixed. I, I can I can spend some time trying to work out something that would that would do that and propose it on, on mainland unless, unless there are volunteers that want to take care of that but uh, I, I I can I can see what I can do. It's encoding policy and device state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, so some, sometimes yeah. only a specific state is safe for the hardware. Yeah. So I, I want to describe that in device tree. Yeah. It's not possible. Uh, Policy. Yeah, I don't know if you heard Bart. The one comment no. was, are, "Are we in trouble with the policy and device tree?" But then again, if it breaks the hardware, uh, that is the policy. Is also just kind of, uh, isn't it just defining a physical limitation of the hardware, so to speak? Yeah. Um, I, I I lost you guys. I I'm, I'm not sure. What oh, I guess the, the question was like, would we fall afoul of the device tree? Um, maintainers if we tried to add a property that was potentially describing policy but it sounds more to me like um it's really just describing how the hardware could be damaged so maybe uh maybe it's maybe not, maybe, uh, maybe maybe the um, the property should be called something like safe state or something yeah so that it, it justifies why we are you're right about the policy so this is this is uh back like a couple of years ago i was working on this Texas Instruments platform, and we had exactly the same issue where we needed to specify some safe state. And uh, I was trying to figure out a way to have these like safe state knobs in the kernel, but never came up with anything useful. And, and we, were, we, we just ended up hard coding it in the driver. But, uh, yeah. but, but at that point, drivers behave differently, and that's Point of view, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. This this wasn't even GPIO. It was a different framework. But uh, you're right. You're right. It 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 does make sense. And I guess we should start a discussion with uh, with device tree folks. Uh, it's already technically a policy. So and all this stuff is already in there. There is the problem with that is that there is no one global correct safe state that we could apply to every driver. This is why it's driver dependent. Yeah, that's why the GPIO book where you define your state safe states for each bin. In the context of a given board. Yeah. I suppose also like you know which driver your system's using. So it could benefit people that are on um certain systems and also especially if if you have the uh, ability to change the driver for your system then you could benefit from this right um uh i mean uh, i imagine most people are thinking about a specific you know chip that they are concerned about this on right so it's feasible for them to potentially handle this if it's mm -hmm. not if their driver doesn't take care of it i don't know um well, one, one could also argue that hogging GPIO lines is very much a policy too. Oh, uh, uh, looks like you had something to say. Yeah. So so the problem with, with have, that it's hardware specific is that you cannot just swap boards. These days, SBCs are commodities. You can take any of the fruit pie boards in your project and you can swap it for a cheaper one if if some other one is not available, but if the drivers behave, the GPIO drivers behave differently, then you end up with weird problems. Right. So I, I was just looking at the regulator device tree bindings. There you have a regulator boot on property. So perhaps we need something like a GPIO GPIO boot. idle state. Boot, boot, perhaps boot. better name. Yeah, well, idle state or safe state. I was thinking about safe state, uh, but idle state makes more sense yeah. yeah and i don't think it's 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 they say dt is describes hardware not software policy but it's not a software policy it's actually the hardware that di dictates that it should be in that state when it's idle so i right. think it's fine to have it in the device tree i will i will write it down uh, as, as my top argument uh, for rob herring yeah rob is not there i can't see it from here no no, no unfortunately not i don't think we have uh Rob or um, 
any none of the device three people are here. Yeah, Frank is probably a DLC. Yeah. Um, no, it starts no. on Wednesday. But Christoph is there, I guess. Christoph, oh. I believe, is at Plumbers, but just unfortunately not in this session because we had several concurrent uh, things happening. Anyway, this 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 does sound like a like an like an interesting thing, and uh, I will I will give it a try. I, I will try to make some time to to work on that and uh, propose something. So, uh, so that's to sum it up from my side. Something like this would basically fix the issues I have with the uh, Chardev interface. Yeah. Oh, sounds sounds like a, a nice takeaway from this box. Yeah, definitely. So, um, are you were saying you might try and prototype that or? You yeah, I, uh, so just I just just mm -hmm. a quick glance. It doesn't look like it's gonna be uh, very complicated. So I will try to maybe come up with something. Okay. Yeah. But uh, just like with the fit thing, where it was supposed to be very easy, uh, many things came up. But um, at the very worst, I will not uh, submit uh, any code yet. I will just start a discussion. But uh, it's, it's always better to. Hello. What's that? Oh, yes. Did you, just did say you it a little bit louder. Yeah, oh yeah, I, I was just, I was just saying that. Uh, not, sorry, not you, Bart. Uh, Chris, Chris was saying oh, okay. something. Yeah, I just thought um, I was just wondering if uh, driver consistency is something that can be tested easily with the kernel testing uh, framework. Know, like I, I've never actually, I've done unit tests with the kernel testing framework, but I've never tested the driver specifically. What What do you mean by driver consistency? Yeah, like uh, sorry, which is yeah, uh, yeah. Jan was saying uh, that some drivers can behave differently uh, inside of the implement, uh, underneath the interface, inside of in the implementation. Mm -hmm. So if the pin is left in an undetermined state. Or non determinate state, uh, then it's inconsistency from the driver's perspective, right? And so it'd be good to test that inside of a framework. But I'm just not sure if the kernel um, test framework, if that's even what it's called, um, is capable of doing that. So, for example, for the Video for Linux 2 stuff, there's Video for Linux 2 compliance, mm -hmm. which basically exercises the use space API and checks that it comp uh, complies to their expectations. Yeah, something similar could be done for GPIO. Sure. Yeah. yeah, so what we're doing right now really test the, the user API, but using like a simulated driver and that only has the, the functionality of an actual driver, but unlike uh, hardware drivers, it actually, it, it's, it's, its behavior is actually pretty consistent because it does revert to some predetermined state when, when lines are free, but uh... I think the, the question was more like, could we run something like this in kernel CI to yes. get coverage yes. on, on the different SOCs? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, not sure because right now, once we like, if a line is not requested, uh, we cannot read its value from user space. Unless we we add well, we, we I maybe the debug access. Uh, it, 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 it is it's visible to our members. Is there some way to build a test into the kernel so that it can execute as part of kernel CI? That's a kernel self test. Yeah, but it's more about the driver, and it would have to be run in hardware, right? It's it's more about unit testing. Yeah, but not much testing drivers. I'm not not sure about it. Maybe you want one to have two GPOs as configured as loopback, and uh, you 
you send it on one side, see that the other behave, side behaves as expected, then you release it and see that it goes to either state or some other defined state. So you want to test the idle states, which you have well defined already in the right state. Exactly what Zephyr does for the GPIO test, though. That's what you want to test. Yeah, right? just basic um, driver behavior, yeah. setting and reading GPIOs. So you, Chris, you say like they have things wired up in a way that yeah. they can do this in a CI With board? With Zephyr, every single test can be run on every single board that's supported even in uh, emulation with QMU. So uh, we have uh, pseudo uh, drivers or pseudo devices in Zephyr. And so we have a GPIO loopback test. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, you can run every single test suite on every single board that's supported. I mean, as long as the hardware supports the test suite. And yeah, loopback test is out, obviously, up there. Okay. Requires hardware in the loop, though, which is, it can be difficult to organize. Right. Interesting. But if, if you want to check for regressions yes. during kernel updates, that's very useful. Absolutely. Interesting. Hmm. We are. Um, there, there is no one using this room, but we are. Um, we are um, technically at the end of our scheduled time. But if if there's uh, other questions or comments people have, we don't have to leave right now. But um, I don't know. Does anyone? I, have... I, will, I will. I will probably need to leave. In yeah. A couple minutes, so. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. You've been with. I was not sure we would make it to an hour and a half. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's actually. Uh, so I think. I think. I think the main takeaway is the, the the idle state property that we should propose. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm quite excited about that. Like we're supposed to. The, the whole point of plumbers is you're supposed to come up with like something actionable, right? So, this is quite good. Also, uh, actually, the virtual virtual to physical thing uh, worked quite nice. So. Yes, yeah, so what what ended up happening is Steve Steve came in and gave me this uh, um, USB um, speakerphone type device, and it's loud enough that the rest of the room can hear you, and it seems mm -hmm. to be sensitive enough that you could even hear people that were sitting in like a couple rows back. So yeah, yeah, uh, that seemed to have worked out well. The the screen with the notes is up on the um, monitor and the thing. The only thing I was not able to figure out is camera. So maybe next time I can we can figure out how to get take, the camera. Take a photo for me uh, of the yeah. room. I'd love to see it, how, okay. how it looks like. Is, is everyone okay if I take a photo? I'll just send it to them on, on a WhatsApp. Cool. Well, thank you for uh, joining Bart. And uh, well, I guess yeah, Lena's gone already, but. Thank you for having uh, me. We are, um, we wish you could have been here. So hopefully next time we'll, we'll all be in person. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> cool. All right. So, take care. Bye. Bye bye.